Proverbs chapter 1. When you find that, please stand with me if you're able for the reading of God's Word as we continue in our series through, uh, as to continue our series on spiritual warfare. Uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Josiah, can you turn that fan off in the bathroom? Uh, Proverbs chapter 1. And we'll start reading with verse 1. Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 1. Now wait till Josiah gets back so he didn't miss the scripture reading. Thank you. Thanks for doing that. Proverbs chapter 1, starting in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of their wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. And tonight's message, as we've gone, uh, continuing on the weapons of our warfare, is the weapon of wisdom. Now, how is wisdom a weapon? Well, it's something that should be a part of the Christian life, uh, just the, the, the living wisely in this world. But wisdom is a weapon in our warfare because the opposite of, wi- of wisdom is foolishness. And the devil, part of the devil's warfare is he loves for people to be foolish and do foolish things. And so one of the weapons we have to fight back against the wiles of the devil is we need to have God's wisdom. And tonight, that is uh, the, the focus of the message is the weapon of wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. And the Bible speaks a lot. Your word speaks a lot about wisdom. And so, Lord, I pray that you would teach us, help us tonight, encourage us, strengthen us in this, help us to see the uh, great need of it, how it should be a, a, a great uh, emphasis and priority in the Christian life of increasing in wisdom. And that we'd recognize, really, it's... Um, something that's a really a byproduct of being in your word and fearing you, that we would increase in wisdom and then also having great desire for it. And Lord, I pray that you would teach us, speak to us through your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I looked back. I, I've preached on wisdom before, but a lot of times it was uh, specific passages in the book of Proverbs uh, regarding wisdom. And I was looking back to see, okay, in the last couple years, and I just did a real quick glance through what the, the sermon titles were. And I was trying to figure out, okay, have I actually done a message, preached the message on just wisdom itself? Uh, because there are certain passages where I've preached on, on various things uh, regarding wisdom. We went through Proverbs on uh, uh, some, some Sunday night, and uh, we did also on Wednesday night. We kind of switched over on Proverbs uh, to different times. But there was a, we did a series through Proverbs which isn't done yet, but we don't have a time where I'm preaching it right now. Um, but uh, wisdom, wisdom being the theme, it's a book of wisdom. And I was looking at that, and I couldn't really find anything that I could uh, just, just very quickly, after a quick glance, find a message where I was preaching on wisdom itself, just, just wisdom, not, not a specific uh, passage, uh, maybe a, st- tip, a specific angle about wisdom. But uh, so I was thinking, all right, well, as I looked up wisdom and wisdom itself, the word wisdom and wise, each of them are used hundreds of times. Wisdom is used uh, over 200 times in the Bible. Um, wise is used uh, a couple hundred times. And, uh, and so there's a lot in the Bible about wisdom. Now, some, not all of it's instruction about wisdom. A lot of it is descriptive. But wisdom is a, a key word in the Bible. Whenever you see something used a couple hundred times, uh, it's worth uh, paying attention to, and, and of course, if it was less than that, it'd still be worth paying attention to. But, uh, but wisdom, I'm going to do my best tonight to try to, there, there was just, when you look at the scriptures, there's just too much about wisdom that uh, we're not going to completely exhaust the subject of wisdom. And I want to do my best to focus on wisdom as it pertains to uh, the weapon of wisdom, weapons of our warfare. And so that's where we start here in Proverbs chapter 1, because Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And the Bible says, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And uh, so we're not dealing with carnal weapons. 
uh, to wage a spiritual battle. We need to have spiritual weapons. We need to have mighty weapons through God. Now, first, we're going to, we need to define wisdom. What is wisdom? What is wisdom? And I know I've done this here before in, in messages in the past, uh, but I just couldn't, I, I, I uh, didn't, didn't know exactly which ones they were, which doesn't really matter. Um, but I was just, just curious about that. So this is going to be a different message on wisdom, even though I preached on wisdom before. Uh, but what, the wisdom as a spiritual weapon. What is wisdom? Well, I guess before you say what is wisdom, lay the groundwork for wisdom, which in the book of Proverbs, we see knowledge, we see understanding, and we see wisdom. Now, I, to, to make it very simple, as far as the definition of wisdom, so I'm going to read the Webster's 1828 dif Dictionary Definition of Wisdom in just a moment, but to really make it very simple, the wisdom would be the follow-up, it'd be build up, building upon knowledge and understanding. Knowledge is facts. Knowledge is uh, just simply things you know, something that you take in. You might read a book. Uh, Josiah and I were at a museum yesterday, and you know, there's a lot of facts there. You just, uh, well, some of them are facts. There's a few things that are not factual. Uh, but a lot of it is probably factual. Um, and so you read those things and all say, well, that's, that's really interesting. Okay, I know that. But just because you know that now, you read it, doesn't mean you understand it. So understanding is the comprehension of that knowledge. And then wisdom is then the skillful use of the knowledge that you understand. So that's the, the easiest way to define wisdom, and, and, and particularly those three words. But as uh, uh, Noah Webster defined it, a few, he had a few definitions for wisdom here. But the first one, the primary definition, he says it's the, the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends and of the best means to accomplish them. This is wisdom in a, an act, effect, or practice, if wisdom is to be considered as a faculty of the mind, it is the faculty of discerning or judging what is most just, proper, and useful. And if it is to be considered as an acquirement, it is the knowledge and use of what is best, most just, most proper, most conducive to prosperity or happiness. Wisdom in the first sense, or practical wisdom, is nearly synonymous with discretion. It differs somewhat from prudence in this respect. Prudence is the exercise of sound judgment in avoiding evils. Wisdom is the exercise of, of sound judgment either in avoiding evils or attempting good. So there's a relationship between prudence, wisdom, discretion. Uh, wisdom is really the skillful determining in your mind what is the best thing to do. Discretion and uh, 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 discretion has to do with actually the operation of wisdom and prudence has more to do with the cautious uh, decision making, the cautious, uh, before you proceed, exercising uh, caution and, and, gaining, and using wisdom in that as well. So they're, they're related, but basically it is, it is the right use or exercise of knowledge, making the right choices based on what you know and, and uh, being able to skillfully go forward through life, uh, making the right decisions. In Scripture, another definition in Scripture, it is uh, human learning. So there is the word wisdom could just simply mean uh, learning, knowledge of the arts and sciences. And in Acts chapter 7, it talks about Moses was learned. He was learned in the wisdom of the Egyptians. And so that wasn't talking about God's wisdom. That was just simply being taught the arts and science sciences. That's less, uh, less of a, a use of wisdom in the Bible. Um, wisdom, in the Bible, there's actually different words that can be translated wisdom, and uh, one of them has to do, it could either mean good wisdom or bad wisdom, either mean God's wisdom or earthly wisdom. And then there's the wisdom here in the book of Proverbs, which is the positive type of wisdom. Uh, number three, uh, definition, quickness of intellect. Readiness of apprehension, dexterity in execution, as the wisdom of Bezalel and Aholiab, Exodus 31. Uh, verse, uh, number four, natural instinct and sagacity, in Job 39. And uh, number five, in Scripture theology, wisdom is true religion, godliness, piety, the knowledge and fear of God, and sincere and uniform obedience to His commands. And it is also, uh, the sixth definition he gives is profitable words or doctrine, and he ties in Psalm 37 to that. 
So different ways uh, of, of viewing wisdom, different uh, definitions, but primary, what, primarily what we're looking at tonight is wisdom It has to do with the right use or exercise of knowledge or wisdom being true religion, godliness, the knowledge and fear of God. There are two kinds of wisdom. Actually, let's go back here and look at uh, Proverbs 1, 1 through 7 for just a moment. We're not going to spend, we're, we're, look, we're going to be looking at some different uh, scriptures here. So while, since we started here, uh, we'll, we'll focus on these verses for just a moment. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding. And so that was the whole point. He's given the, the introduction to Proverbs, and this is the purpose of Proverbs, is to help increase in wisdom. And that's why um, the, there's the, uh, say, the, the practice of reading a proverb a day, uh, 31 Proverbs. And if the uh, if month has 31 days, you read one proverb a day. Or if it has 30 days, then just double up on one of the days. Uh, but it's so important that you could read a proverb a day and just read Proverbs 12 times a year. It's that important for just your practical living for increasing in wisdom. It's that important. You, you can do that and it doesn't get old, reading the book of Proverbs. To know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment and equity, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. And subtlety to the simple, that means you know, you're... You, you're actually giving some skill and some craftiness to the simple. The simple ones are the ones who are easily influenced, who could easily be influenced by the foolish. The simple are the ones who don't have a buildup of knowledge and wisdom. And so they're kind of at that point where, which way are they going to go? And it depends on what kind of instruction they get that's going to really influence whether they turn into a fool or whether they turn into the wise. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man, verse 5, a wise man will hear and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. Notice this, verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So the first thing you need to know, and if you're going to know anything else, you need to start with the fear of the Lord. The Bible also says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So here we see the contrast between the wise and the foolish. Uh, we see those who are going to be building in their wisdom, increasing in their wisdom, that they're going to have the fear of the Lord, and that's going to put them on the right track uh, when there's a fear of the Lord. But fools despise wisdom. I, mean, don't, I don't want this. They push back against it. It is a foolish thing to do, and they're going to continue in their foolishness until uh, they think otherwise. Two kinds of wisdom. Two kinds of wisdom. There is uh, man's wisdom, and then there's the wisdom that comes from the Holy Ghost. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. First Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 1. And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. And so here he's saying, I, I didn't come to you just with the most wonderful speech that sounds so wise and, and so high and, and lofty as far as the, the as, as in a sage of wisdom that the words that are just streaming out of his mouth, oh, look how wise he is, look how knowledgeable he is. Uh, and they're hanging on, he didn't want people hanging on his words and his wisdom and an earthly type of wisdom, a man's type of wisdom. But he wanted them to, he wanted the Spirit of God, the power of God to be manifest, to be working in their lives. And so he preached a very plain, straightforward message, not to have just some special, um, special wording that people would be taken in by that. Oh, wow, he's got such a way with words. No, it was just straightforward in that. And in that he wanted their faith to be in the power of God. Not in the wisdom of men. And how many times, this is a very subtle thing that many times 
Christians can have their faith in the wisdom of men and not in the power of God. And it's very subtle. And I think if, you, uh, if, if we increase in wisdom, we'll be able to tell the difference. So you say, well, give me, give me an example. Well, it's, it's something you gotta, something you got to detect and discern at the time. I don't know if there's any type of teaching or, or, or examples I could, uh, I could give, except for the fact that what Paul's doing here, he said, I came not with uh, excellency of speech or of wisdom and, or enticing words of man's wisdom. So the best way I could say this is there's, there are some people who have a way with words that are very enticing, but it doesn't necessarily mean God's power is behind it. That's the best way for me to say that. But as far as how that looks and how that plays out, you need God's wisdom discretion when, when you actually hear it. You need to be able to tell the difference. Um, and there, there are many. Uh, there are many like that. Uh, many people that follow after big name. There are a lot of big name preachers that are that way. And I'm not going to necessarily mention anybody. Some of them I'd mentioned I've been too hard on up to this point. So I'll just uh, give them a rest. No. Um, but, but no, you could think of some probably. But think of they just, they just suck you in. They're so enticing. It sounds so good, but it doesn't necessarily mean God's power is behind. It doesn't mean what they're teaching you is solid Bible doctrine. But, oh, yeah, they have a way with words. And so Paul was trying to avoid that. He wanted, he wanted that whatever good came out of his preaching, that it was evident that it was the power of God, that it wasn't going to be some way with words that he had, some excellency of speech. He wanted it to be the power of God. Now, I'm all for proper communication. We should be able to communicate clearly to people. Uh, but it's not about putting together the fanciest message or saying things in the fanciest way and, and uh, showing off, oh, look at, uh, he's got so much wisdom. But he wanted people to trust, the people to trust in the power of God. Verse 6, how be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect. And so there's a contrast here between man's wisdom. He didn't want them trusting in man's wisdom, but in what he was speaking, there was Wisdom, it was God's wisdom. Yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor either have entered into the heart of man, the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, but God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself to judge of no man. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. And so we actually have, because we have the Holy Spirit living within us, we have the opportunity to discern, we have the opportunity to have some insight into those things that the natural person cannot understand. And then he goes on in chapter three that he couldn't even speak unto them as carnal, but as uh, I'm sorry, he couldn't speak unto them as spiritual, but as unto carnal or babes in Christ. And so there were things that was going to hold them back uh, the, that would keep them from uh, benefiting from the things of the Spirit of God, the insight of the Spirit of God. And so two kinds of wisdom, and uh, turn to chapter, actually let's continue through chapter 3, and uh, let's go down to verse 10. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation... Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved yet so as by fire. 
Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. But for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise, that they are vain. So once again, here we see the contrast between the wisdom of this world, the wisdom of God. There is a difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom, wisdom that comes from the Holy Ghost. I finally got that little bug, a little gnat. Um, Verse, uh, look at chapter 4 and verse 10 in 1 Corinthians. We are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. So in the world's eyes, they're fools. Why would you go to that trouble? Why would you, why would you do what you're doing? That just seems foolish. There's so many other things you could do in life. You could make a lot more money. You could have much more prestige. You could live more comfortably. That's the way the world thinks. But then it seems foolish to them, but in God's eyes, it's a wise thing to do. To put God first, to, to, to live for Him, to fulfill His will no matter what. To follow His leading. Now, one of the <laughs> examples of worldly wisdom is, uh, you know, it's amazing how people can be so smart and so foolish at the same time. It really is. Now, Josiah and I went to a science museum yesterday. And it was very good. It was very, very good. Uh, we enjoyed it. And um, they had a display there. And I took a picture of it because it was fascinating because I'd never seen that giant of a house fly before. Uh, but they had this huge house fly. I mean, you can see the details of it and everything. I mean, is this, you know, probably this big, you know, fly. <laughs> if you don't like flies, you wouldn't, you wouldn't like that display. So <clears throat> very, very... Uh, very good house, very interesting house fly. But, uh, you know, I, I said this this morning. I'll say it for the benefit of you tonight that didn't hear it this morning. So I spent, a good, I spent good money at that place. We spent money for admission. We spent money on the uh, 4D uh, film that they showed, and that was, that was good. We showed, spent money in the 4D is... Uh, 4D is you put on the 3D glasses, but then there are other effects that they do. So it's, it's really, it's really neat. It's really good. Um, and, um, and then there are actually some 4D things that are actually you put on, not, not at the museum, but something Josiah and I have done before is you put on actually virtual reality uh, goggles or, or headset, and then you also have the, uh, you know, you, you, you feel the effects of stuff. Uh, although I don't know if we had, if, did we have effects at that other place where we put on the headsets? I don't know if we did. I don't know if there was water or anything, but um, but our first our first experience with 4D, I they're think you working on it. I they're working on it. If the first our first experience with I think what you'd call 4D would be um, was at a place called Flyover America in at the Mall of America, and so you sit in it's like a ride and your legs are hanging down, and then there's this huge screen. I mean, monstrous screen. They turn the lights off. Monstrous screen, and it's as if you're in an airplane and your legs are dangling, and you're literally you feel like you're flying over these mountain peaks and doing all these things, but as you're going through the clouds, you feel a mist. And uh, it's, re it's really neat. So in this case, it was a little different take on it, but you put 3D glasses on, but there's also some other special effects that uh, you get to experience. So very good. That's what 4D is. Um, but anyway, and this one's about sharks, by the way, so you can imagine that would be, uh, that'd be pretty fun. Um, but anyway, so I, I spent, good, spent good money on that, on the planetarium. And, uh, and all of that on parking, you know, Boston, parking in Boston is not cheap. You know, the garage right next door, you spend a lot in parking. So I spend good money to find out the most life-changing piece of information that I've ever heard. So this giant housefly here, this display of a housefly, there's a little sign that, that below it that says it's a housefly. And then it says, humans and houseflies share a common ancestor from 900 million years ago. That was just a life-changing revelation that 900 million years ago, houseflies and humans came from the same ancestor. I mean, what a, what a thought. And 
So of all the knowledge there, of all of the, the interesting facts that, there, that are true, there's a lot there that's true. I'm not saying it was all false, but that was, that was, a, that was a new one to me. Um, then to see that, you say, how could they, how could they believe that? There's so much knowledge here. There's so, much, so many smarts here. We, you know, we, on our way there, we drove by Harvard, and you know, MIT is probably not too far away. And uh, you know, all, so much knowledge, so many inventions, so much innovation around there. And yet, humans and houseflies are related by a common ancestor 900 million years ago. Huh? <laughs> Now, here's the difference is uh, for those who believe the Bible, they wouldn't use the term common ancestor. They would say we have a common designer. So any similarities you see between humans and other creatures would simply be, be, would simply be because we have the same designer, which makes that, that's a little wiser and makes a bit more sense than saying we have a common ancestor. Yeah. But to the world, believing that God created the heaven and earth in six literal days and, you know, that the earth isn't millions and billions of years old sounds foolish to them. It sounds foolish. And I know there's many, there's Christians over time, over decades, you know, over a lot of time, they have tried to reconcile what the Bible says and try to make it more palatable for people who believe in, uh, in the evolution and uh, macroevolution. And... After reading that, I thought, why would we even try? Why do we need to try to make it palatable to them? We just say, here's, here's what the Bible says. And then, of course, then they can see the same scientific evidence, but they have a different interpretation of the evidence based on what their bent is, what their bias is. And so the foolish things, there are things that are foolishness with the world. They think it's worldly. They think it's wise. They think it's their wisdom, their great knowledge that they have here. But in God's eyes, it's foolishness. And what the world thinks is foolish is actually wise in God's eyes. There's also, not only is there, um, not only is there man's wisdom and Holy Ghost wisdom, there's also wisdom from above versus the wisdom that is from below. Turn to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. James chapter 3. But yes, I, I would, just on the record, I, I recommend the, the museum. It's a very good museum. So um, that did not ruin the experience. I just found it funny, actually, that there's literally a giant housefly here. And then it says we share a common ancestor. Oh, hi, Grandpa. Yeah. Um, and uh, let me shake your hand. Uh, didn't know we were related. Sorry for all those flies that I killed. Do you realize then if you're... If we have share a common ancestor, you're killing your relatives when you're swatting flies around the house. I have I have a lot to answer for then. You know? <laughs> um, wisdom from above versus wisdom from below. James chapter three verse thirteen. Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth for not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So there's first of all the wisdom that is from, uh, uh, I want to address the wisdom from below first. This is, it says it's earthly, sensual, and devilish. So there is a wisdom from below as opposed to a wisdom from above. Not all wisdom is ref referring to <coughs> God's wisdom. The wisdom from below is earthly, meaning it only pertains to earthly things and is based on earthly philosophies with no heavenly perspective. It is sensual, which means it's guided by the senses, how one feels, or by base desires and natural appetites. Now, how, how many times do people think they, they're so wise, but really what's coming out of their mouth is really how they feel? It's not, that's not based on any God's, God's wisdom or Holy Spirit-led wisdom. It's simply they are basing what they say on how they feel. That's sensuality. Guided by the senses, guided by your own natural appetites. And then devilish, only serves the devil. 
This kind of wisdom only serves the devil and his kingdom. It is opposed to the knowledge of God, opposed to the things of God. It leads to strife, envy, and confusion in every evil work. But then we have the wisdom that is from above, which is pure, clean, or holy. You know, when you have God's wisdom, it's going to lead you to more holiness, cleanliness, uh, living, holy living. Peaceable helps you to live in peace with others. How does, how does that work? Well, um, if you're living skillfully, there are things that you could do or say that uh, might not help you to live peaceably with others, and then there are other things you can do. Uh, if, if, if there are things you can do based on how much wisdom you have that will allow you to live peaceably with them, and then there are other ways, maybe there are foolish decisions, foolish things to say uh, or do that would not uh, promote uh, peaceable living. Uh, easy to be entreated. This means persuadable, compliant. Now that doesn't mean that uh, that doesn't mean that we're just supposed to be open to anything and everything, and we're just persuaded of anything. Oh yeah, because I'm operating God's wisdom. That's not what that means. It just, it's, it means not obstinate. The person doesn't have an obstinate, stubborn attitude. Full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality. Uh, and uh, that would probably be a connection to uh, James 2 when he says, uh, in verse 1, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. For if there come unto your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, and there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, and ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, and say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become judges of evil thoughts? And so there, that's making a judgment based on what you're seeing regarding how people are dressed, their appearance, whether they look rich, and oh yeah, this person's got to be, uh, th this person's got to be the good person, and then the, the, this, this one that's dirty, and this one that doesn't have as nice of clothing on, and and uh, they look a bit worn and ragged. Yeah, that person definitely is not as good as this person. That would be partiality. But the wisdom from above does not operate that way. It means, you know, the becoming... You cannot judge what is on the inside based on if a person has... If they're rich and have nice clothing or maybe they don't have as much. And they, don't, you don't know, they don't know what's in the heart. And so uh, God's wisdom would lead us, wisdom from above would lead us to understand that and not to operate that way. And also without hypocrisy, meaning that the wisdom from above, it doesn't lead you to wear a mask or pretend. That means you're genuine, you're, your yay is nay, your nay is nay, here's where you stand, and uh, here's who you really are, uh, and uh, not having to put on a facade uh, and, and trying to make people think you are a certain way and, as opposed to the way you really are. Two kinds of wisdom. Wisdom, now the wisdom we should obviously, uh, based on the scripture, should be pursuing is the Holy Ghost wisdom, wisdom from above. Those should be the priorities, uh, the kind of wisdom we should be seeking and desiring. Wisdom affects lifestyle. Wisdom affects lifestyle. James 3.13 says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. And so someone who's operating in wisdom it's going to be evident in their lifestyle. And turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. And verse 15, Ephesians 5.15. Uh, Ephesians 5 and verse 15. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And so there, there's the, uh, it's, it's going to have an effect on you when you are walking circumspectly, when you are aware of your surroundings, and you're aware of the pitfalls, you have your eyes wide open, you're watching out, you're being cautious, you are looking uh, As the Bible says, the prudent foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. It means you're walking, and remember, prudence is, is related to wisdom, uh, just more with a certain caution. And so you're seeing what's ahead. You're seeing this, this direction here. This is, uh, I see, foresee the evil coming, and so I'm going to try to avoid that. And rather than 
going forward like the simple ones who don't aren't operating in wisdom and they're going straight forward into the uh, punishment or the destruction or the consequences of that of getting involved in something that they shouldn't have but it affects our lifestyle redeeming the time because the days are evil if you have the knowledge and then you understand it. You really understand it. The days are evil. We need to redeem the time. There's so much time that can be wasted. Uh, and, and this is where I had trouble with this message. Is there's so many scriptures that I could, could have included here. We just, uh, in one message, really cannot do. But I think of the verse, uh, So teach us to number our days so that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. That goes along with redeeming the time. We number our days, recognizing our lives are limited uh, in their scope here on earth. And so let's number our days. We don't know the number of our days, but we number our days, meaning we recognize our, our days are numbered. And so let's apply our hearts to wisdom. Let's apply our hearts to, if you're walking in wisdom, you're going to redeem the time because the days are evil. You recognize there's so much that can be wasted. There's so much trouble in the world, but we need to redeem or buy back that time and use, use it wisely. Use it for profit. Use it for good things. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And we'll, we'll get to the will of the Lord here in just a moment. Wisdom affects lifestyle. It should cause us to redeem the time. We would uh, apply our hearts to wisdom. that We would understand what the will of the Lord is. Circumspect, meaning you're, you're looking around. Cir circumference, you're circumspect. You are, you're not just focused uh, on yourself. You're not focused just on your little world, you're not focused on just your own priorities, but you're, you're getting the big picture and you are applying properly what is the most proper way for me to go in life. The value and blessings of wisdom. Turn back to uh, Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs 1 and verse 20, the Bible says, Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the street. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn you at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you. Uh, notice what happens here. Because I have called and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded but ye have said it not, all my counsel, would none of my reproof. I, will, I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, your destruction cometh as a whirlwind. When distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. When the consequences come upon the foolish and upon the simple, when they have the opportunity to respond to wisdom, and then all of a sudden, oh, now I'm going to get serious about getting some wisdom. Wisdom's going to say it's too late. You're already, you've already gone that far where you're facing those consequences, and now even wisdom is not going to deliver you from those consequences. You got, need to have the wisdom ahead of time. To avoid those consequences, when you have the wisdom, you can then do the things in life that are the right things to do that don't subject you to these consequences. Verse 30, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof, therefore shall they eat of the fruit of their own way and be filled with their own devices. For the turning away of the simple shall slay them, and the prosperity of fools shall destroy them. But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from the fear of evil." That is a great principle there. The prosperity of fools shall destroy them. There are a lot of foolish people who are very prosperous and they don't see the need for wisdom because they have prosperity. In the end, it's going to destroy them because they weren't operating in wisdom. Who's, but notice verse 33 again. But whoso hearkeneth unto me, that's wisdom, shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. That doesn't mean that nothing bad ever happens to you. But based on what is being described here in the prior verses that we just read, it means that you don't have to fear the same consequences of foolish decisions if you are hearkening to wisdom because you're not doing the same things that the foolish are. So if you don't do the same things that the foolish do, you don't need to worry about the consequences. You know, if you, <laughs> if you, don't, if you don't drink and get drunk and then drive, you don't have to worry about getting into a car crash and killing somebody because of impaired driving. 
Now, there are other ways you can have impaired driving. You could be too tired. You could be not paying attention. You could be on your cell phone. But I'm just talking about the choices we make. You know, Western Massachusetts also is becoming the, uh, like, marijuana central now. I mean, it really is. I mean, every time I turn around, there's a new marijuana place going in. There's a new cultivator. And, you know, and there are people who, you know, some, somebody said, uh, somebody said the other day, uh, what's, like, what's, you know, what's gonna, all this going to come to? I said, well, we're just going to have a, I forget now the words I said, but basically a society full of just, Pie. Well, that was basically what I was saying, uh, <laughs> but not, no, I didn't just say that. I, basically, the people are, you know, totally out of it, and yeah. and they're and I don't know if I said it in this way, but they're going to be lacking in good judgment. Yeah. They're going to be lacking in good judgment, and there's going to be more foolish things that are done, and 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 people, it's going to, you know, it dulls the sense. You got to settle them down, so. People jump from, people without Christ and without the peace of God jump from one thing to another to pacify them and to calm them down. That's, that's what this is. It just, it just makes them, it just gives them whatever that good, nice feeling is that, that, that they want to. So, well, you know, at least, oh, I, for example, there was a hockey player from a number of years ago who uh, apparently, I just saw the headline, didn't read the story, but he said, basically, you know, mar- cannabis, marijuana saved his life because he was heavy drinker, heavy drinker. But then apparently once he got into marijuana, it helped him with his drinking problem. So from the world's wisdom, wow, boy, wow, that's good because at least he didn't, at least he didn't stay, uh, <laughs> stay into his drinking. But all the world knows how to do is trade one indulgence or one thing to pacify them for another. But when the answer lies in the Lord Jesus Christ and finding fulfillment, hope, and peace through him and salvation. But, the, but basically, you as a wise person, if you hearken to wisdom, you dwell safely, meaning I don't need to worry about the same types of consequences that the foolish do. doesn't mean no bad thing's going to happen. Uh, uh, look at chapter uh, verse 2. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee, so that thou incline thine ear into wisdom and apply thine heart to understanding, yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasures, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. He layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment, preserveth the way of his saints. Thou shalt understand, then thou shalt understand uh, righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, to leave the paths of uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, also to deliver thee from the strange woman. In verse 16, even from the stranger, which flattereth with her words. Um, wisdom <laughs> would be proper application of knowledge. And um, we saw an odd, Josiah and I, when we were in the bathroom, and we were not far from the, uh, the cafe, the the, the, I forget what they call it. Did they call it a cafe or whatever the place is. You get the food there, different places to get food at the uh, museum. Somebody stuck a QR code right next to the bathroom sink or the hand dryer or something. And it said to see our menu visit or to see our menu scan this QR code. I'm thinking, well, it must, we're not too far from the uh, restaurant. But I th- so we were curious. I said, yeah, I think my, I don't know if my phone even has a QR code scanner. And uh, Josiah said, oh, yeah, and somehow he knew this, I don't know. Um, he said, oh, yeah, if you go to Bing Search on your phone, you know, that has a QR scanner because I have a Bing Search app on my phone. I said, oh, yeah, I think that uh, sounds familiar, so I bring that up. Now, thankful, I was thankful for Bing that, that they have it set up this way, and probably others do as well. So I hold it up, and, and I'm holding it up to the scanner, and then it shows me a, a URL that is connected to that QR code. And based on what the URL was, I knew that it was not a website that I wanted to visit. Yeah. Let's just say it was an inappropriate menu. It was not a food menu. 
And so I said, all right, well, well, and we just left and we walked away and I thought, I guess I should have just ripped that off the wall and thrown it away, but I, I didn't do that. But in hindsight, I would have done that again if I had, had, I, uh, had that other opportunity. But the wisdom helps deliver you from the strange woman, even from the stranger with flattereth with her words. And there's the enticement, but then the wise person realizes, no, this isn't going to be good. This is going to lead me down a wrong path. This is going to be a this seems enticing, this seems pleasant now, this seems good now, but it's going to take me down a bad path. It's, going to, it's not going to be the way of God's wisdom. It's going to be the way of bondage. It's going to be the way of regrets and problems. But the, uh, the value and blessings of wisdom, first of all, is safety and no, avoiding bad consequences. It's the opposite. Wisdom is the opposite of foolishness. And another value and blessing of wisdom is knowing God and his will. Turn to Ephesians, back to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1 and uh, in verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, Cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Now that's a great prayer request. Paul's saying, this is what I'm praying for you. This is my request for you, one of his requests. And it was that he, that he would have, that they would have the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The more you get to know God and his will, uh, you're going to have wisdom. That's a blessing of wisdom, as you know, God and his will more. And then Colossians in chapter, uh, verse 18, actually, before we go to Colossians, verse 18, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So there you see the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. That has to do with the light bulb turns on, and now you understand, now you can operate in wisdom. Colossians chapter 1, just a few pages over, Colossians chapter 1, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Mm -hmm. What a great prayer request. I, I love the ring. It has a nice ring to it. <laughs> and it's a great prayer request that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthening all his might, and he goes on. But one of the value, uh, the value and one of the blessings of wisdom is that you know God better and you know his will, if you have wisdom. So many people struggle to know the will of the Lord. But to know the will of the Lord, uh, you need wisdom. You need to have an eyes of your understanding, being enlightened. You need to be acquainted with the Word of God because that's the source of wisdom, God's wisdom. And then the Holy Spirit, in using God's Word and applying that to your life, the Holy Spirit guides you as to uh, what the will of the Lord is based on the Word, not apart from the Word, but based on the Word, principles of His Word. And we need wisdom. We need wisdom to know His will to know God better. And knowing God better increases your wisdom, and the more wisdom we get, the better we know God, because he is the source of wisdom. Uh, and then we see wisdom's lack of recognition in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. Ecclesiastes chapter 9. You know, wisdom is something that uh, doesn't get a lot of publicity. You know, have, have, you ever heard, uh, have you ever heard of an award for, you know, the wisest person? Yeah, we're going we're gonna to give award. We're going to give a scripture memory award. We're going to give an attendance award. We're going to give, uh, the world has their own awards. The best actor, best actress, best singer, the best uh, whatever producer. But do we have uh, an award for the wisest person? And it's probably, it's better not to have an award for the wisest person. It's a wise thing not to have an award for the wisest person. But, the point is, how high of a priority is wisdom in the world today, and um, and even in our churches? How high of a how high of a priority is it in our Christian life? 
Or at times it could be that wisdom is actually what makes the difference, but people just simply don't recognize it because they're looking at something else. It's a little more flashy, a little more appealing. Something that draws more attention. In Ecclesiastes 9, verse 11, I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise, nor yet riches to the man of understanding, to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happeneth to them all. For man also knoweth not his time as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare. So were the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly upon them. So there's the principle of it doesn't matter in this case if you're wise, if you're not. If there, there are things that just happen to all of us. Those are, and it says under the sun. Those are just things that happen to life to, in that life to all of us. But notice what he says here in verse 13. This wisdom have I seen also under the sun and it seemed great unto me. There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it, and besieged it, and built great bulwarks against it. Now there was found in it a poor wise man, and he by his wisdom delivered the city, yet no man remembered that same poor man. Then said I, wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. How many times do people listen to more of the enticing words of man's wisdom? Go to what is big, go to what is flashy, go to what is more appealing. They listen to that because of those factors rather than is this actually wisdom and it doesn't matter how insignificant the person might be it doesn't matter how big a church or small church might be Uh, it doesn't matter how um, old or young or poor rich or poor this poor man his wisdom was is despised his words are not heard verse 17 look at this the words of the wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools notice that Those who rule among fools, they get a lot more publicity because they just draw more attention to themselves. That's the crowd that you notice more. The wisdom is quiet. Not drawing attention to itself, themselves. But if you purposely make the choice, I'm going to listen to the ones with the wisdom, no matter how loud or soft, I'm going to ignore the loud and I'm going to go with, here's what the wisdom is. That's the way to go. In verse 18, wisdom is better than weapons of war, but one sinner destroyeth much good. And so there's the good that one wise man can do, but there's also the great damage that one sinner can do. So wisdom has a lack of recognition. The wise, you're not, you know, if you're wise, it doesn't mean people are just going to always listen to you. It doesn't mean they're always going to come to you. They may go to somebody else. Wisdom's requirement. We're finishing up here with these last... uh, couple of scriptures here. Wisdom's requirement. Proverbs chapter 18. In the Proverbs chapter 18. Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 1. Through desire, a man, having separated himself, seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. So wisdom starts with a desire, but also requires separation. Now, there are apparently some of the commentators, there's, there have been different viewpoints of this verse, but I believe it's in a positive way. It's, it's regarding a positive way because of what it says in verse 2, a fool hath no delight in understanding, but his heart may discover itself. So I think, I could be wrong, but there's a contrast there. There's the man who's separating himself and through desire seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. But then there's the fool who hath no delight in understanding. Now, I suppose that someone could be seeking and intermeddling with all wisdom, but all they're looking for is, yep, their heart to be revealed, as, as the saying, oh, I need to find myself. I need to, and some, so those people are, they're so self-absorbed that and they, they, they go through life just always focused on them, 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 because I need to seek out my heart and what's in my heart and discover who I am. And just it's a self-absorption. Because the fact is, if we have a proper attitude toward wisdom, and yes, there are times we do need to examine our hearts, but there's some people who live that way. It's all about obsession with their own heart and making themselves a better person in an unhealthy manner that they do not look outward. But they, but they basically, in other words, the only thing that they delight in, a fool, the only understanding they want has to do with their own heart. 
but through desire a man having separated himself seeketh and intermeddleth with all wisdom. That's the way I, that's the way I look at the, I think those verses are. I know there's, there's been different viewpoints on that over the years for some difficulties there, but I, that's the way I look at those verses. And, uh, but it, there's the, the point here being it requires separation. And you cannot expect, by application here, you cannot expect to be increasing in the wisdom of God when you don't separate from some things in the world. Wisdom requires separation. You're not going to increase in that wisdom. It's, it's going to corrupt your mind. It's going to corrupt your thinking. It's going to corrupt your life when you're filling up your mind with worldly things. It could be the, the, uh, the humanistic philosophies. It could be the immorality. It could be the foul language that you find on television and on, on streaming or whatever it might be. There's all kinds of things that can corrupt and that is filled with the and wisdom of the world. And by the way, there might be things that, that you think are relatively clean or clean enough for you, but they're still filled with the wisdom of the world, not the wisdom of God. And you want to increase in wisdom, we need to separate some things, separate ourselves. Have, first of all, have a desire, but then separate ourselves and seek and intermeddle with it. it means we get involved with it. So wisdom's requirement, separation, and finally, increasing in wisdom is to be more like Christ. Turn to Isaiah chapter 11. Isaiah chapter 11. I think I saved, I, I was thinking about doing this one first, having this point first, or I decided now I'm going to save the best for last. Uh, Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1. And the Bible says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Prophecy of Christ here. Notice verse 2. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Notice this. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. Mm. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. So Christ himself is endued with the spirit of wisdom and understanding. And the wiser and more understanding you are, that's part of the process of becoming like Christ, being more like Christ, being a Christian, Christian life. But I want to connect it here with what's next. The spirit of counsel and might. Jesus Christ has the spirit of counsel. He's endued with the spirit of counsel, which means... Being like Christ means that we can provide, we should be able to provide good, godly, wise counsel, advice, guidance to people. That the words that come out of our mouth should be what guides people in the right direction, points people to wise decisions. That's who Christ is. There are pastors who have said, well, the only counseling I do is from the pulpit. That's been said before. I don't know if I've ever personally met one or heard one, but I've heard that being, I've heard of that being said. Well, you know, the only counseling I do is from the pulpit. Well, there are times, and so part of this, this spiritual warfare series is to help us both with our own discipleship, our own walk with God, but then our own help, are helping us to minister to others. And so in ministering to others, the best way to be able to minister to others is to be more like Christ in wisdom and understanding and in the spirit of counsel and might. And then it says the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. So at least this is what Christ is endued with. And the more we become like Christ means we should be increasing in these areas. Increasing in wisdom is be more like Christ. 1 Timothy 1.17 says, Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. He's called the only wise God. God is the source of wisdom. He's, he's really wisdom personified. Uh, wisdom starts and proper wisdom starts and ends with God. Of course, there's man's wisdom, which we've already seen. But speaking of wisdom, increasing in wisdom, talking about the right kind of wisdom, that is to be more like Christ. It's been said, you know, I think uh, wisdom is more caught than taught. How do you teach wisdom? You know, I can teach you facts. And I can even try to help you understand. But when it comes to the application of knowledge and understanding, that's something you, you need God. You need God's spirit in your life working 
moving, guiding you. And so it starts with your own heart attitude is do you have the desire? Are, are you pointed in the right direction to even be in a position for God's wisdom? Maybe there's someone who would be uh, more simple-minded here and you need to increase in knowledge and understanding and then wisdom and you need to take heed just as the Solomon in Proverbs as he's, he's saying, he's, at, he's, tell, he's telling my son, my son, he's wanting his son, receive these words, receive these words. And any parent today would say, my son or my daughter, receive these words and you'll gain in your understanding and wisdom, knowledge, and it'll help you in life. There's practical benefits to this. And maybe there's somebody here who's uh, maybe made foolish, makes foolish decisions. Doesn't mean you're a complete all-out fool, but you make, we all make foolish decisions once in a while. I mean, let's be honest. But we don't ever want to be what the Bible calls just an out-and-out -out fool. But that, that foolish decisions are a characteristic of our lives. Because that means we're not operating in God's wisdom. Let's increase in wisdom. Let's be more like Christ. Let's be in a position. Let's... let's that's, that's the main motivation. I want to be like Christ. I want to increase in wisdom. But recognizing there are practical benefits to it and recognizing the world's not going to see things the way you see them. When you're operating in God's wisdom, they're going to have their own ideas. There's going to be a difference. And we need to not be afraid of that. We need to not let that scare us away from uh, continually seeking God's wisdom. Because God's wisdom will help us then skillfully navigate this world in which we live that is hostile to God's wisdom, that is high and lifted up in its own humanistic wisdom. But we can skillfully navigate and be, have a fruitful life in God's wisdom. And then we can, we can help others by using wisdom to help others, to minister to others, to reach others. The Bible says, he that winneth souls is wise. So there's wisdom in, in winning people. Wisdom required in winning people. It's a wise thing to win people, but it, it requires wisdom. Let's uh, engage in the battle with this weapon, very important weapon of wisdom. And as it pertains then to giving godly counsel, uh, we'll probably delve into that a little bit more, I think, as we get into that aspect of things um, in the future. But for tonight, focusing on it is a weapon, it's a needed weapon to engage as disciples of Christ ourselves, but then to go forward in opposition to what the devil's doing, to fight back against what God is doing. I'm sorry, to fight back against what the devil is doing in the lives of others, trying to keep them in bondage, people who need deliverance. Let's have the right use or exercise of knowledge, the choice of laudable ends and of the best means to accomplish them. Based on the principles of the Word of God, let's be filled with God's wisdom.